Zechariah chapter 9 as we continue on here toward the end of the so-called minor prophets, although if if your experience has been anything like mine, they are anything but minor. Um, The prophetic word here is astounding. Zechariah really excites me as a book because of the date in which it took place. And we know the date because he tells us the date at the very beginning in the second year of the reign of, of Darius. And so we know that it was 520, right? 520 B.C., is that what we talked about? And then down to 518 and then later after that. So this is after the Babylonian exile. So everything prophesied in this book, everything of this prophet cannot be about the Babylonian exile unless he's referring back to it, which he does a couple of times. But all the prophecies are forward looking. It's as though we have hit the slide. You know, the slide all the way down into the New Testament to the coming of Jesus into this world. And Zechariah talks about that, and we are into the thick of it in the third section of the book that we opened up on Sunday morning. Remember, Zechariah, son of Berechiah, son of Edo, means the Lord, the Lord, at the Excellent. So, two oracles left here. Oracle number one, chapters 9 through 11, and oracle number two, chapters 12 through 14, both focusing on Messiah, both focusing on the comings plural of Messiah because Zechariah at this point is dealing with two appointed times the first coming the appointed time that happened right on schedule I won't get into that tonight but if you want to look into that and think it through we studied it and talked about it I believe in Daniel chapter 9 we looked at the exact dating of things and how precise the father is in bringing the son into the world at the appointed time the first coming guess what the second coming will be at the appointed time Just as he came right on schedule the first time, so Jesus will come right on schedule the second time. Picking up in verse 9 of chapter 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem! Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now we looked at that closely Sunday morning broke it down to understand what that tells us about our Messiah. Those three things, that that He's just, that He's endowed with salvation, that He is humble. But we also looked at the fact that that verse, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, contains elements, it's a mixed verse, if you will, of both His first and His second coming. His first coming, obviously what we've called the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem on that donkey's foal. And that happened... But he also talks about things that relate to the second coming of Jesus. All of verse 10 is the second coming, and we'll get to that in just a minute. But we need to hover here in verse 9 just a little bit longer. Because he says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. The elections are over. Can I get an amen? Hallelujah. Boy, I remember back during Watergate how all I wanted to do was watch Bugs Bunny and there was nothing but politics on TV, you know? And so here we are today and there's been so much of the ads back and forth and so much of the political and I'm just so glad that we can now focus on the presidential election two years away. (laughs) Big things are happening in the world. But not what we think. Not certainly what the media portrays. While all eyes have been on the election cycle and all eyes have been on, you know, the the Republican wave that took place last night. Other things have been taking place that no one really was aware of. Things that are much more dear to the Father's heart. Things having to do with Zion. Let me read you something here. Headline. Solicitor General. Israel has no claim to Jerusalem. Just as Russia has no claim to Crimea. (laughs) According to an article by Adam Credo in the Free Beacon on November 4th, lawyers for the Obama administration compared Israel's control of Jerusalem to Russian claims over the Ukrainian territory of Crimea during oral arguments this week before the Supreme Court. In a case... Concerning the rights of U.S. citizens to list Jerusalem as part of Israel on their passports. 
U.S. Solicitor General Donald Varelli, who is rumored to be in the running to replace outgoing Attorney General Eric Holder, drew the comparison on Monday while he attempted to convince the Supreme Court that Jerusalem is not officially even part of Israel. This is a big deal, my friends. This is before our country's Supreme Court. A decision that will be handed down will either say, yes, Lord, we accept Jerusalem as your capital, or no, we do not. And while everybody's looking at the economy and what perhaps this new uh, divided government can do about it, the Lord is looking at Zion. And the decision that is made about this court case, mark my words will impact this country far more than any economic policies ever could. He goes on and says, The controversial case hinges around Menachem Zivotofsky, who was born in Jerusalem in 2002. Zivotofsky's parents requested that Menachem's U.S. passport bear Jerusalem, Israel, as his place of birth. A request that was denied by the Obama administration on the basis of its long-standing policy not to recognize the holy city as part of Israel. The Zivotofsky family sued. Good for them. Following the decision, and the case has been stuck in judicial limbo ever since. The Supreme Court agreed to hear the case, and initial arguments by both sides were presented this week. Obama administration lawyers argue that the case infringes on the president's executive right to conduct foreign policy. By acknowledging Jerusalem as Israeli territory, the White House would lose its credibility in the peace process, as well as its jurisdiction to maintain or to manage foreign affairs the government maintains. And I won't bore you with any more of that. That's big news. That's huge. And it reminds me that though we may have highly trained, incredibly learned men in the higher levels of government, with all kinds of degrees and experience, some of them, the reality is they don't know their history. And they don't know their Bible. The same Bible that many of them took an oath and swore upon. They just don't know. Let's go back. Let's understand Zion just a little bit. Because in this verse, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Zion is Jerusalem. Jerusalem is Zion. Behold, your king is coming to you. So honestly, whether you thought about it this way or not, what you believe, how you feel about Zion is directly related to what you believe about Jesus Christ. Because that's where he's going. That's where the king is headed. But let's go back and figure this out. 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 7 is the first time Zion is mentioned in the Bible. 2 Samuel 5, 7, which says, David captured the stronghold of Zion, that is, the city of David. The stronghold of Zion. What does Zion mean? Zion in, in Hebrew, Zion is literally a parched place. Zion is perched atop the Judean hills. It is a city among the mountains. Desert mountains, dry mountains, truly a parched place. But parched doesn't just mean dry or arid. It also has the sense of austere. Those of you who have seen Masada, there is an austerity about that. It's dry, it's desert, it's desolate. You look down and you see that dry salt sea down there. But it's austere. There, there's something impressive about it. Jerusalem, far more so. A parched place, an austere place. But it also means, Zion means, a signpost, a monument, or a marker. Zion is a signpost of the will of God. Zion is a marker. Zion is God's chosen city. On this earth. David didn't conquer Zion because David wanted it. David conquered Zion because the Lord desired it. It was his desired habitation. Zion came to mean so much more than simply a city once belonging to the Jebusites. In fact, they didn't call it Zion. They called it Jebus. But the Lord refers to it as Zion. That stronghold, that marker. 
That signpost. Ezekiel chapter 5, verse 5, thus says the Lord God, This is Jerusalem. I have set her at the center of nations with lands around her. And one of those lands distantly would be America. As great a nation as America has been for these 200 or so years. It is not the greatest nation on the earth. And it is certainly not the greatest nation in the history of the world. Zion is. Jerusalem is. Well, Rick, but America is you know, far more wealthy. Not in God's eyes. Well, America has far more influence, not according to the Lord. No, Zion is at the center of nations. David only captured what God desired. Psalm 2, verse 6. As for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. Psalm 50, verse 2. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God has shone forth. And the last mention of Zion in the scriptures, and there's some 150, 160 more. That's not Jerusalem. Jerusalem is mentioned like several hundred times. I don't remember the exact number. Some of you may. But Zion, separate from Jerusalem, though it is Jerusalem, 150 to 160 times in the Bible. And the last mention of it is Revelation chapter 14, verse 1, that says, John says, I looked and behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion. Because that's where he's coming. That is where he's headed. So the burden of the word of the Lord came as a stronghold of encouragement to the daughter of Zion. That is the Jewish people. The people of Israel. Why was it an encouragement at that time? Shout for joy, O daughter of Zion. How would that encourage a Jewish person to even hear that from the prophet Zechariah? Well, I'll tell you, it wasn't in the greatest shape when he said that. You know, the temple was being rebuilt, but most of the city was still a mess. There was no wall up around the city. That would come. Nehemiah would help bring that. But things were not good. And as we talked about last week, Israel was a post nation nation a post kingdom nation they no longer would have a king sitting on their throne they would no longer have the kind of autonomy that they had had in the years prior and they had to figure out how to live in that Isaiah chapter 1 verse 8 told us that the daughter of Zion is left like a shelter in a vineyard like a watchman's hut in a cucumber field like a besieged city There's a sense, a prophetic sense of the desolation of Zion. And as the people came back to Zion, to Jerusalem, it was desolate. So for Zechariah to come along and by the word of the Lord, the very burden of the word of the Lord to say, Shout for joy, O daughter of Zion. Man, that would sound good. I could use a little joy, the Jewish people probably thought. We could use a little triumph in this day. And verse 10 tells us, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. Now, note this, Ephraim referred to the northern kingdom. Jerusalem referring to the southern kingdom because the two kingdoms had been previously divided. And you remember in 722 B.C., the northern kingdom fell to Assyria. And in 586, the southern kingdom, Judah, fell then to Babylon. Now he's talking to both and saying, I'm not going to have chariots for Ephraim Ephraim anymore. He says, I will uh, cut off the horse from Jerusalem and the bow of war will be cut off. Why? No defense. No weaponry. What are you talking about, Lord? And he will speak peace to the nations. And his dominion will be from sea to sea, from the river Euphrates to the ends of the earth. There's your executive privilege. His dominion. One of the great contrasts between the first and the second comings of Jesus Christ is that now, following his first coming, he offers peace by his spirit. You want peace in your life? It is available to you. Comfort and encouragement is immediate by the Spirit of God. He offers it to you. Now, when He returns, peace will be brought by His dominion. Now it's of His Spirit. Now it is internal. Now it doesn't even always make sense. 
But it's there. It's incomprehensible, the Bible tells us. But we have it by His Spirit right now. Then, there will be peace on earth by the dominion of the rule and authority of Jesus Christ out of Zion. Psalm 2 verse 9 says, You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. For those of you who get uncomfortable, you want Jesus to stay in the manger. Or perhaps you want him to stay gentle and easygoing. Keep him on the donkey, man. He's going to come and, man, there will be no, there will have been no power in all history that compares with the power of Jesus Christ. And the rule and the authority. Wise, perfect, righteous, yes, just, a yes, loving, but he will dominate this planet. It will be under his dominion. Now, therefore, Psalm 2, verse 10, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth, you Supreme Court justices. (laughs) Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. I've told you before, Psalm 211, worship the Lord is literally, uh, following that it says, do homage to the Son. Do homage is kiss the Son. A kiss of worship, a kiss of obedience, as though bending down and kissing the ring of the great ruler. Psalm 110, verse 2. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. Psalm 19, verse 15 tells us, from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that it, with it he may strike down the nations, and he will Rule them with a rod of iron. And by the way, that's the third of three references in the book of Revelation to Jesus ruling with a rod of iron. In case anybody missed it. Three times. No one will have any question, any doubt about who is the boss. And it will be Jesus. But he offers peace now. He offers it gently by his spirit. He requires peace then. He will speak peace to the nations and he will tell the nations, no, you will hammer your swords into plowshares. We will do away. I mean, you want to talk about nuclear disarmament? All your weapons are in unacceptable, he will say. And he'll have the right and the authority and the power to do that. To put away all warfare. Right now, he offers peace. Even in the turbulence of our world, Jesus is still offering peace. Philippians 4, 7, the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension. And I love that because it's true. Will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That's now. But again, when he returns, it's peace by dominion. The Spirit through Zechariah is simply repeating what he has said before. As he says, his dominion will be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. So Psalm 72 verse 7 says, In his days may the righteous flourish and abundance of peace till the moon is no more. May he also rule from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. The Spirit is now repeating what has been said. Micah chapter 5 verse 2. But as for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you, one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. And he will arise, Micah 5 verse 4, and shepherd in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will remain, because at that time he will be great to the ends of the earth. There's not going to be anywhere on the planet that doesn't know about or bow to his dominion and his authority. Now, the word continues to address the daughter of Zion. Verse 11. As for you also, because of the blood covenant, the blood of my covenant with you, I have set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to the stronghold, O prisoners who have the hope. This very day I am declaring that I will restore double to you. Now note that. He says... Because of the blood of my covenant with you, I have set your prisoners free. What would they understand that to mean? You see, looking back, the only other time that phrase was even used in the Hebrew Scriptures was at Mount Sinai. The blood of my covenant. There at Sinai, Exodus 24, verse 7, Moses took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. 
And they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do and we will be obedient. Didn't do so well. How often have you done that yourself? Lord, I'll obey you. Whatever you say, I'm ready to do. And how quickly we don't. And he is so gracious and so good. But we're told, Exodus 24, verse 8, Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant, which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. And here he's reminding us, because of my blood covenant, I will set your prisoners free. But we understand something now from this side of history. We know what that was all about. The blood of the covenant then. The blood of the covenant referred to again now by Zechariah was only a shadow in type of the real thing. Hebrews chapter 10 reads, For the law, since it was only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things, can never by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make perfect those who draw near Otherwise, they, would they not have ceased to be offered? Because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness of their sins. Now, we've read that recently. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. But in verse 10 of Hebrews chapter 10, he writes, By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. That's the blood covenant. And the blood covenant God made with Israel and all the blood of the sacrifices. We've we've looked at these things. Talked about the book of Leviticus. We've gone through that book. Man, what a bloody book. Great book. I love studying it. I had no idea there was so much blood. It's cool. (laughs) Five chapters opening up the book of Leviticus. Talking about the five different sacrifices, blood sacrifices of Israel. And you get into about chapter 17, verse 11 of the book of Leviticus. And he says, man, without the blood there is no cleansing of sin. It's all very bloody, and you look at it and think, oh, I mean, that that almost looks pagan. Although he never required blood sacrifice of a human being, only of animals. Because it was a blood in type, a blood type, if you will, (laughs) of the greater blood covenant to come. And at the last Passover, Jesus pulls it all together. And finally we get it. He took the cup. He gave thanks. He passed it around. Then he said in Matthew 26, 27, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. Because of the blood covenant, my blood covenant with you, I have set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. What is this waterless pit in verse 11? Some of your other translations may say dry cistern, and that's a better translation. I will set your prisoners free from the dry cistern. Not the dry dry brethren. (laughs) The dry cistern. Okay. What's a dry cistern good for? Two things. It's really only good for two things. We only know that it was really used for two things. When a cistern was not used to hold water, and a cistern would be a, a great, vast, open area... Uh, like a a big container. When it wasn't used for water, it was used either for holding grain or for holding prisoners. And oftentimes, prisoners would be dropped into a cistern where they couldn't get out for holding until they could decide what they were going to do with the prisoner. Jesus himself was most likely dropped down into a waterless pit, a dry cistern in the house of Caiaphas, Psalm 88, verse 4, I am reckoned among those who go down to the pit, the psalmist prophesied. And that happened on the same night he declared his own blood to be the blood of the covenant. Do you see the connection? Drink this. This is my blood of the covenant. It's that blood that sets the prisoners free from the dry cistern. Jesus poured out his blood to set us free. Jesus went into the pit to pull us out of the pit. His blood alone rescues from the dry cistern of our sin. 
I love that he says this very day, I am declaring, I will restore double to you. How many people have in your lives felt like you've wasted so much time? You've lost so many years that you could have been walking with the Lord. I hear this from older saints often. People who have come to the Lord later in life. Man, I think about the 20, the 30, the 40 years. I could have been having the peace and walking with the Lord like I am now. And it's such a waste. And God says, I'm going to restore double to you. I'm going to make it doubly good. You know, in in another place, and I believe it's in Joel. Is it Joel less? I will restore to you the years that the locust has taken. And see, God is capable of that. If you ever have a friend or, or someone you're talking to about the Lord, and they just seem to be putting him off because there's no way they can recover 30, 40, 50 years of life, you tell them, look, the, the Lord can recover in a day what you spent a lifetime messed up with. He's doubly good. And it goes on to say, verse 13, I will bend Judah as my bow. I will fill the bow with Ephraim. And I will stir up your sons, O Zion, Against your sons, O Greece, and I will make you like a warrior's sword. And then the Lord will appear over them, and his arrow will go forth like lightning. And the Lord God will blow the trumpet and will march in the storm winds of the south. Greece. Greece here. I will stir up your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece. The word Greece there is actually Bene Yavin, or Bene Yavan. Bnei Yavan is sons of Javan, sons of Yavan. We first hear about this guy, Yavan, back in Genesis chapter 10, verse 2. The sons of Japheth, remember Shem, Ham, and Japheth, sons of Noah? The sons of Japheth were Gomer and Magog and Madai and Javan and Tubal and Meshech and Tyrus. Genesis chapter 10, verse 4 says the sons of Javan were Elisha and Tarshish, Katim and Dodanim. What's amazing about Genesis chapter 10 is called the table of nations. And you can go through and find out where people came from right out of Genesis 10. Tracing ancestry all the way back literally to the three sons of Noah. And we can see where they went and where they departed. The, the, the Ham and the Hamites went south down into the African regions. And, and Shem, the Shemite, the Shemitic people, Middle East, the Arabs and the Jews. And Japheth went west. They were the more European people. Greece. The descendants of Javan are Greece. They were at one time called the Ionians. The Ionians became the Grecians or the Macedonian Greeks with Alexander the Great and all. And for you history buffs, check it out roughly 300 years after this prophecy that says, I'm going to bend Judah as my bow, I'll fill the bow with Ephraim. So so this is a prophecy that indicates Judah and Ephraim are together. They're fighting together. They're one team. They're not separate nations anymore. I'm going to bend Judah like the bow, fill the bow with Ephraim like arrows. I'm going to stir up your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece, the sons of Yavin. And I'll make you like a warrior's sword, and the Lord will appear over them. Again, his arrow will go forth like lightning. So there's going to be an epic battle of some kind here between the sons of Zion and the sons of Javan, between Israel, united Israel, and, and Greece. And again, you historians may recall that about 300 years after the prophecy, there was an epic battle between the sons of Zion and Greece. The Jews in Judea fought a brave and successful military campaign against the Seleucid Greeks or the Syrian Greeks. I hope you're getting all this down because I'm going to have to ask you later what I told you. Led, the Jews were led by a family called the Hammer. Hammer time. I said that last week, didn't I? I I don't know why. The Hammer, the Maccabees. Judah Maccabees. The, the brothers Maccabee, Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel chapter 11, we studied about the Maccabees, also foretold, prophesied that this event would take place. And in 164 B.C., the Jews, united, drove out by the, by the military and guerrilla warfare tactics of the Maccabee bros, drove out the Greeks under the authority and rule of a man named Antiochus Epiphanes. So it was a shadow, a type of Antichrist to come. In fact, 
he brought about something that was just, well, abominable. An abomination of desolation, setting up an idol in the temple, throwing pig's blood soup all over the inside of the sanctuary, messing it up. But the Maccabees, they drove him out, and the Greek army as well, drove them out. But understand, though the Jews did that, 164, drove out the Syrians, drove out the Greek Syrians, you see some perhaps fulfillment here, but as Kyle rightly described the event, he called it the weak beginnings of the fulfillment of this prophecy. By the way, we're coming up to the time when Jews celebrate that very event in the holiday of... Hanukkah, right. The festival of lights that Jesus even attended. Look at that. Uh, We'll note that when we get to the Gospel of John. Jesus went to the festival of lights, or the holiday of lights, the feast of dedication down in uh, Jerusalem. Anyway, so this battle happened in 164, but it was a weak beginning. It wasn't the actual fulfillment because the breadth of this oracle can't be limited to that event as you read through it. The sons of Javan represent the Israel subjugation, the Israelite subjugation of all Gentile world power overthrown as Messiah comes into the world. Watch this. Verse 15, continuing on. The Lord of hosts will defend them. Note that back in verse 14. It says, the Lord will appear over them. (laughs) And verse 15, the Lord of hosts will defend them and they will devour and trample on the sling stones. The sling stones. That's kind of a picture of how pathetic any army raised up against the Lord is. It's like a kid with a slingshot. David notwithstanding. Okay. David had the power of the Lord, which is what made the the stones in his sling so powerful against Goliath. But anyone else is pretty pathetic to go against an army with a slingshot. And that's the picture here, pathetic weapons of the enemy. They're going to devour, they're going to trample over the enemy's weapons. They will drink and be boisterous as with wine, and they will be filled like a sacrificial basin. Wine there is probably a picture of blood. It will be a bloodbath, and they will be filled like a sacrificial basin, drenched like the corners of the altar. And that's where we understand it's bloody because the corners of the altar were drenched with blood. This epic, amazing battle. And we're told in verse 16, And the Lord their God will save them in that day as the flock of His people. For they are as the stones of a crown sparkling in His land. For what comeliness and beauty will be theirs. Grain will make the young men flourish and new wine the virgins. As in a great, wonderful, marvelous celebration of final Deliverance of absolute freedom for the sons of Zion over the sons of Javan. Again, picture of the Gentile world versus God's people. It's a cameo of what a number of other prophets have already described. The final and greatest triumphus of Christ. The ultimate triumphal entry, not on the foal of a donkey, but on a great white horse as he comes back into the world and begins his dominion, his glorious reign. When he comes, he says, back in verse 13, I will bend Judah as my bow, and I will fill the bow with Ephraim, and this is beyond, it's bigger than the Maccabees. And listen what happens at that time. Draw, the, draw the, the bead here to Revelation 14, verse 1, where again, John said, I looked and behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion. Well, who's standing there with Him? Exactly. 144,000 having His name and the name of His Father written on their foreheads. 144,000 Mormons? 144,000 Jehovah's Witnesses? 144,000 people who go to the bridge? <laughs> those, those positions have been filled. And not by Jehovah's Witnesses who came before us. 144,000 from 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel, the Bible could not be more clear. We are talking about Jewish people. Jewish people who are sealed 
for deliverance. Jewish people who would be a mighty army of evangelism in the tribulation. Who will stand there in mass from Ephraim, from Judah, from all of Israel standing together at Messiah's glorious return with the Lamb on Mount Zion. Whether the Supreme Court agrees with it or not. (laughs) Verse 12, going back. Look at verse 12 again. Listen to this. Jump back there. Return to the stronghold. I like that. Return to the stronghold. But note what he says. O prisoners who have the hope. Literally, it's O prisoners of the hope. Come on back to the stronghold, you prisoners of the hope. And you t-shirt makers, I want that one on a t-shirt. Prisoner of the hope. What do you mean? You could say that today the Jewish people are prisoners of the hope. Anyone know what their national anthem is in in Israel today? It's Hatikva, the hope. They sing of the hope. Hatikva. And they are prisoners of the hope. They remain at this point. And I say this with great love for the people of Israel. But the Jewish people remain bound to an almost wistful belief that their Messiah will come. And somehow, some way, miraculously fulfill all these things. Even though they have missed that he came once already. And they're waiting for this, this, this coming of Messiah. He will come. He has come. He is coming. And so, yeah, they are today prisoners of the hope. Bound to the very hope that, that doesn't, hasn't quite comprehended. And I'm talking nationally. I'm not talking about Messianic Jews who know who Jesus is, who, who call upon the name of Yeshua HaMashiach as their Lord and Savior. I'm talking about those who don't realize yet, who haven't gotten that Messiah has already paid this world a visit. And is coming back. They're prisoners of, of the hope. People today are imprisoned to all kinds of things they hope will make life better. Unhealthy things. Addictions. You know, one more donut. You know where I'm at with that. <laughs> prisoners of debt. Hoping that, you know, maybe just one more credit card will, will, will help. Prisoners of harmful relationships let me suggest to you brothers and sisters in Jesus that we are the real prisoners of the hope we are shackled to the Savior we are bound to the beloved Son we are chained to the Christ I know that's a weird way of looking at it because I know that it's for freedom's sake I've been set free right how can you say you're bound to the beloved Shackled to the Savior. Listen, Romans 6.16. It's a great verse. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? So get this. If you're going to follow Jesus Christ, you become a slave, a bond servant of Jesus Christ. That's what? That's the option. You want to become a Christian? You are enslaved to Jesus. Well, I don't want that. Okay, what's the alternative? Paul says, You are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. you got two choices in this world. You can be a slave of the Savior or you can be a slave to sin. The Savior will bring you ultimate freedom. Sin will bring you death. We are prisoners of the hope. Prisoners belonging to Jesus. And listen to this verse, and let's get this one right. 2 Corinthians 5.14, fellow prisoners of the hope, says, For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all dies. Now, your New International Version, soften it. They say it this way, and I used to love this. In fact, this was the only way I used to quote it. The love of Christ compels us. Sounds better, doesn't it? I like that because the love of Christ motivates, impassions, you know, drives me forward. I'm, I'm compelled by love. No, that's not the word. The love of Christ controls. The, work, the word in the Greek is suneko. And suneko literally is constrains, compresses, or presses in on. 
Here's how the Greek word is used. I know I'm, I'm, I'm rabbit trailing, but this is so important to get. As prisoners of the hope. To say that the love of Christ controls me, here's how the Greeks use the word controlled. Suneko. A besieged city was suneko. That is, armies pressing in from all sides. They use the word as a strait forcing a ship into a narrow channel. They would use the same word as a cattle squeeze. (laughs) Or what's called a squeeze chute, forcing an animal into a fixed place for milking, medication, or... (laughs) And fourthly, suneko is used to describe a prisoner in chains. Christ's love controls me. Christ's love presses in on me. Christ's love, you could say, compresses me, constrains me, imprisons me. And someone might say, why would I want that? Because nothing, nothing frees a person from the pit better than to become a prisoner of hope in Christ Jesus. And I'm speaking in irony here, but to be a prisoner of Jesus is to have ultimate freedom. Freedom that only Christ Jesus can bring. To, can bring. First Peter 1 Peter 1.3, to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To be able to say, Psalm 103 verse 2, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of His benefits, who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion. I am a prisoner of that hope. I am bound to that hope in Jesus. And I see a bunch of you smiling because doesn't that feel right? And isn't it good to know I am, I am controlled by the love of Christ. I want to be controlled because otherwise I'm out of control. And so we are crowned with loving kindness. That word is grace. Crowned with grace and compassion. Uh, kind of like Israel who we're told are stones of a crown, verse 16, sparkling in his hand, or in his, in his land. Now, going on in chapter 10, verse 1. Ask rain from the Lord. At the time of the spring rain, the Lord who makes the storm clouds, and he will give them showers of rain, vegetation in the field to each man. Now, Washingtonians, we might say, why would we ask for that? <laughs> We're in the rainy season right here in Washington. Begins about October and usually runs through the next September. There are, <laughs> there are here uh, three Hebrew words for rain. Three different words. Um, there's a total of four words in the Hebrew that describes different kinds of rain. Matar is the first word. Matar is ordinary rain. And it just speaks of Israel's rainy season. Matar. Malkosh is the spring rain or the latter rain. That's the rain that comes later in the uh, calendar year for Israel. Gashem. I like that. Gashem. What does that sound like? Gushing. (laughs) That's heavy duty rain. That's heavy torrential downpours. Gashem. And Yoreh. Yoreh is the fall or the early rains. So you have the the Yoreh, the early rains in the autumn. And then you have the latter rains typically coming then in the spring. The Malkosh. Now, this is interesting to me. Three of the four words for rain are used there in verse 1. Ask rain from the Lord at the time of the spring rain, the Lord who makes the storm clouds, and he will give them showers of rain, vegetation in the field to each man. Ordinary rain, latter rain, heavy rain, early rains. And the only one that's not used is the early rains. So what? So this. The Lord is directing attention to his plans to bless Israel in the last days, the days of the latter rain. Okay? That's the direction that the prophet is going in chapter 10. Ask the Lord to bless you with the latter rains. The latter rains are the most important rain in Israel because that's the rain that's going to get them through the hot, dry summer season. You've got to have the latter rains. We have compared before the latter rains to the the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Who is poured out in these last days, Acts chapter 2, on both sons and daughters. The latter rain. 
And that's where we are in this. The Lord is directing all attention to His plans to bless His people in the last days. Joel 2.23 So rejoice, O sons of Zion, and be glad in the Lord your God, for He has given you the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you the rain, the early and the latter rain as before, and the threshing floors will be full of grain, and the vats will overflow with new wine and oil, a picture of the coming kingdom. And the outpouring, the final latter rains to bring them into their kingdom. Because you see, the Lord remembers and the Lord blesses at the appointed time. But did you catch what he said at the very beginning there of chapter 10? Ask. Ask for it. He tells the people to ask what he's already said he's going to do. Ask for the rain. Well, Lord, but you said you were going to bring the rain. Yeah, but I want you to ask for it. He desires to bless. But the Lord says, ask. Why? He's engaging faith. Here's what I'm going to do for you. And I'd like you to start praying that it happen. But, but Lord, if it's going to happen, why do I have to pray about it? Because I want you involved. Because I want you to engage. Because I want to increase your faith. I want you to see that as you pray, stuff starts to happen. Yeah, but you said it would happen. Exactly. Let's work together. I believe is the implication here. The Lord loves to involve His people in His power. In His process. In what he's doing. Ezekiel 36.35 They will say, This desolate land has become like the Garden of Eden, and the waste, desolate, and ruined cities are fortified and inhabited. Ezekiel 36.37 Thus says the Lord God, This also I will let the house of Israel ask me to do for them, and I will increase their men like a flock. Ask me! Come on, come on, ask me! First, the Lord promised to bless. And then he says, let them ask me to bless. We call that agreement in prayer. Agreeing prayer. Just agreeing with what the Lord wants to do. Agreeing with what he has already promised. Praying his promises. Praying the word of God. Praying over what we know he's going to do. When we say, Lord Jesus, come quickly, we're not asking him to do something he's not planning to do. We're just in agreement with him. We're saying, align us to your will. By the way, part of the problem with the idea of the prosperity gospel is in claiming things God never intended for you to claim. Well, how do I know what God wants me to claim? Pray His promises. Pray His word. Pray what He has already declared. You will be in alignment with God and you can claim all these promises. Well, how come? Because He's already given them. They're there for the taking. Claim the Word of God. By the way, rain in Scripture is another picture of the Word of God. Well, I thought seed was the Word. It is. But so is rain. Isaiah 55, verse 10, As the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it bare and sprout and furnish seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so will my Word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. Let me encourage you to take verse 1 of Zechariah 10 and apply it to the Word of God in your life. What do you mean? Ask rain from the Lord. Say, Lord, pour your Word out on me. Give, Give me understanding of your Word. Bring your Word to remembrance in my mind. Ask Him for the rain. Ask Him for the spring rain. Well, that would be the, the latter rain. Great time to, to have a little rain of the Word in your life is latter part of the day. In the evening, like you're doing right now. This is latter rain stuff. You're getting the latter Word at the end of the day. Take the early rain at the beginning of the day. And then just the common rain throughout the day. And there are times you're going to need the deluge of God's Word. I try to give you that as often as I can. The deluge, the torrential downpour of the Word of God. Man, soak it in early in the day, late in the day, throughout the day, and in large amounts throughout. The reign of the Word. Verse 2. For the teraphim speak iniquity, and the diviners see lying visions and tell false dreams. They comfort in vain. Therefore, 
The people wander like sheep. They are afflicted because there's no shepherd. The Lord here describes two things that afflict his flock. Try saying that three times fast. (laughs) Afflict his flock and steal hope. Two things are mentioned here. Teraphim and diviners. Teraphim trickery and diviners deception. What's he talking about? The teraphim. Teraphim is a very specific kind of idol. It's mentioned several times, seven or eight times in the Bible. Uh, You may recall that when Jacob fled from Laban, that Rachel took her father's teraphim. The teraphim is a household god, a household idol. It often had to do with the authority in that house. But check it out, the teraphim was specifically believed to give divine direction. It was the magic eight ball of the pagan world. You remember the magic eight ball? Magic eight ball, what should I do today? Should I ask her out on a date? Don't you dare. <sighs> no. Remember that thing from, what was it, the 80s, 70s or 80s, the magic eight ball? It's like Ouija boards. The whole idea behind the teraphim was they would ask it questions and seek wisdom from this household idol. We have our own versions today in, in our culture and around the world. Prayer cloths. I don't know if you've ever seen a televangelist say, hey, put your hanky up against the TV and we'll pray over it right now. Why? <laughs> Prayer shawls. Let me scratch a little bit here if I may. I don't mean to pick it wounds or scabs or, or, or sensitive places in people's lives, but there are a lot of Christians who are so into the Jewish thing that they really see something more magical about praying with a prayer shawl. Boy, I, the Lord the Lord tore the veil down and said, Come right to me, you know? Rosaries. <laughs> Crosses. Sainted medals. Rabbit's feet, which, by the way, obviously we're not too lucky for the rabbit. (laughs) We have the foot. Both the teraphim, those household idols that they would use and they were superstitious with and they believed would speak prophecy to them or give them indication of what they were to do for the day or in their life, and the diviners, the teraphim and the diviners, listen to this, they only had power over the helpless if it was given to them. The only way that these household idols could could hold sway and note what he said about them, they speak iniquity. The word there is literally futility. They're futile. But people still turn to them like like the astrological signs, like the zodiac. I I mention this one every now and then because I know there are Christians who open up the paper and go, what's Virgo doing today? Who cares? It was Babylonian and it was wrong several hundred years ago. It's all changed now. But people do it. It's futile. And the diviners, they they give lying visions and false dreams. They comfort in vain. How can they have this power over the people? Only if the people give it to them. And we were talking about that today in our staff meeting. Remember, the Bible tells us that he has disarmed the principalities. Our foe is an armless foe, which means the only power the enemy has over you, has over me, is what I give him. The only power he has is to lie, to deceive. And if I'm willing to listen, well, then he's got some sway over me. And the helpless ones of Israel, the people are wandering, they're afflicted, like sheep without a shepherd. Gang, it's because they gave the power to the teraphim. They gave the power to the diviners by going to them and listening in the first place. The weak had to shake the magic eight ball, right? They had to play Ouija. And the afflicted had to seek out and trust the soothsayer. And they handed the enemy his power. Don't hand the enemy power over you. Don't give it to him. He only has what you offer him. What did the Lord just say about the rain? He said, ask me. Come to me. Come, come talk to me. Oh, every other resource, listen, every other resource you go to in this world is limited or vain. 
Go to the Lord. Ask Him. I don't know how we're going to survive our marriage. Go to the Lord. I guarantee you, if your marriage is struggling, if you as husband and wife would commit to praying together every day, you will see miraculous change in your marriage. Committing to having Jesus at the center. Committing to asking the Lord in. Go to the Lord. 1 Corinthians 2.16 Who has known the mind of the Lord that He will instruct Him? But we have the mind of Christ. Why would I go to a horoscope? Why would I read a self-help book? Why would I listen to Oprah? I don't get it. (laughs) The household superstitions and false prophets could only cause wandering and affliction. Same thing today. And five centuries later, Jesus arrives on the scene and guess what he sees? Matthew 9, 36. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. This had just played out in the life of Israel. Jesus is the God with the shepherd's heart. He wants to nurture. He wants to care for. He wants to look after. He wants to protect his sheep. He wants to do that with you and me. And he's just saying, come on. Let me. Ask me. By the way, this is the reason for God's anger at poor shepherding. Verse 3. My anger is kindled against the shepherds, and I will punish the male goats, literally the he goats. Let me just point out, the shepherds are probably the spiritual leaders of Israel, and the he goats are the political and or wealthy leaders of Israel. For the Lord of hosts has visited his flock, the house of Judah, and will make them like his majestic horse in battle. From them will come the cornerstone, from them the tent peg, from them the bow of battle, and from them every ruler, all of them together. They will be as mighty men, treading down the enemy in the mire of the streets in battle. They will fight, for the Lord will be with them, and the riders on horses will be put to shame. I will strengthen the house of Judah, I will save the house of Joseph, and I will bring them back... Because I have had compassion on them, and they will be as though I had not rejected them, for I am the Lord their God, and I will answer them. Ephraim will be like a mighty man, and their heart will be glad as if from wine. Indeed, their children will see and be glad. Their heart will rejoice in the Lord, watch this, when I whistle for them, to gather them together. For I have redeemed them, and they will be as numerous as they were before. Man, I am angry at these at these lame shepherds, at these he goats, who are not doing right by my people. And I'm going to move them out of the way, and I'm going to make my people glorious again. That's the essence of that. Now I'm going to come back to that whole section on Sunday morning because there's some stuff I really want to dig into here. That's remarkable. You might want to go back and read over it and pray through it. See what the Lord shows you. And we'll talk about it on Sunday. But for now, just note the word in verse 8, whistle. I will whistle for them to gather them together. Some translations say hiss. I just don't see God hissing. <laughs> you know? And it can mean that. The word can mean hiss. But shirak in the context... Shirak is the word. S-H-A-R-A-Q. Shirak. I'm going to whistle for them. What it describes is a shepherd's pipe. A shepherd's whistle. A a signal for gathering the flock. And it could either be a little whistle that the flock just knows, or it could be the shepherd's own whistle. You know? (laughs) I'm not a great whistler. A signal for gathering his flock. The Lord is going to... Whistle for them. Let me just read you something. I want you to, in fact, just listen to this. You might even want to close your eyes and let this soak over you for just a minute. The shepherd will whistle for his people. Jesus said, John 10, verse 1, Truly I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he's a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them. And the sheep follow him because they know his voice. 
a stranger. They simply will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of the strangers. John 10, 16, he goes on, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also. And they, speaking of you and me, they, they will hear my voice and they will become one flock with one shepherd. And the Lord says down in verse 27 of John 10, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. I just love the thought of Jesus as the good shepherd. He's also the chief shepherd, as Peter refers to in 1 Peter 5. He's the ultimate shepherd. But the fact that Jesus would choose the picture of a shepherd to describe himself speaks volumes about his nature and character. And I love that in Zechariah, he says, I'm going to whistle for my, for my people. I'm going to whistle for them to gather them together like a shepherd whistles for his sheep. And it almost has a, an affectionate playfulness to it. You know? As you would whistle for your little pet. Come on. You know, come on. So the Lord will whistle. Now, watch this. This is something that should not have been missed, but it probably was. Verse 9. When I scatter them among the peoples, they will remember me in far countries, and they with their children will live and come back. Wait. Wait. Weren't they just back? I thought thought they already had come back. Here's the value of recognizing the placement of Zechariah in history. And when the Lord said this, he did not say this before the Babylonian captivity. He said it after. Note back in verse 6 what he said. I will strengthen the house of Judah. I will save the house of Joseph. And I will bring them back. They're already back, Lord. What are you talking about? I will bring them back. (laughs) And I wonder if anyone at the time listening to the oracle recognized what the Lord was really saying. They would in A.D. 70. They would recognize that they were being driven out yet again. God says, I'm going to bring them back. He already brought them back from Babylon. But now Zechariah is prophesying. He's going to bring them back Again, as Isaiah says, I'll show in a second, I'll bring you back a second time. They're going to be driven from the land again, Zechariah is saying. Not just to Babylon, they're going to be scattered all over. Verse 9, I will scatter when I scatter them among the peoples. They will remember me in far countries. They with their children will live and will come back. But God's saying, I'm going to scatter them. Now get this. Beginning in 586, when the Jews went into Babylonian exile, that was really the start of the times of the Gentiles. That was the beginning of the diaspora that continued from 586 all the way up, really to about the early 1900s. The dispersion of the Jews throughout the world, all about the nation of the world. But here... Before the Lord began to bring them back, 2,000, almost, well, yeah, 2,500 years roughly before He would start to bring them back into the land. Before the national rejection of the Jewish Messiah, the Lord is already promising He's going to bring them back. That's grace. That is remarkable mercy. The same idea can be seen in Jesus on the cross, the promise of the Lord that He was going to redeem you 2,000 years before you were born into this world. I'm already planning for your resurrection. I'm already scheduling your salvation. And there are unsaved people right now, all around us, who have a schedule and appointed time for their salvation that the Lord's already planned out. They don't know about yet. we just got to tell them. We've got to let them know. In the meantime, until God would bring them back, as He's already, we've seen in this generation, they've begun to come back into the land, to pour into the land. But before that, 
He says, I'm going to scatter them. Now, this is interesting because the word scatter there is zara in the Hebrew, and it is always used positively. If you compare it to all other scripture where this word is used, Hosea chapter 2, verse 23 is an example. I will sow her for myself in the land. Same word, zara. I'm going to scatter Israel into the land like seed. And here in Zechariah, he says, Verse 9, when I scatter them among the peoples. What, what he's saying here is not a negative, it's a positive. Now, I, I hope you can get this faster than I did, because it took me a couple hours of scratching my head trying to figure out, what are you talking about? If this is positive, how is this scattering of Israel positive? Well, it may not have been positive for Israel, but it sure has been positive for the world. Think about the fruitfulness of planet Earth because the Jews have been scattered throughout. Think about the value of the Jewish people spread out all over the world. And what's so sick and ironic is how the world has castigated the Jews, has, 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 has you know, persecuted them and pushed back against them. And God's saying, look, I scattered them for your good. I, I sowed the Jewish people among all the Gentile nations that they would be blessed. Remember what God said to Abraham, in you, by your seed, all the nations of the world will be blessed. We have been experiencing, in fact, history is testimony to that blessing. I'm going to sow them throughout the world. God is a sower. Because God wants to bless. And He sows to bless. Romans 11 verse 12 says, If they're, speaking of the Jews, if their transgression is riches for the world, and it has been, and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, and it has been, how much more will their fulfillment be? Romans 11.15, he says, If their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? I'm going to sow them throughout the world. And their sowing into the world has allowed for our harvesting, which will in turn inspire their harvesting. It's just a magnificent thing God has done. In fact, Paul, after describing it in Romans 11, says, how many are the thoughts of God? He he just, he's awestruck at God's amazing plan with Jew and Gentile alike. Well, verse 10 going on, he says, I will bring them back from the land of Egypt and gather them from Assyria. And both Egypt and Assyria here, because these were past tense uh, enslavements, They're pictures of the future. They're pictures of from the north and the south and all around. I'm going to bring them back. I will bring them into the land of Gilead and Lebanon until no room can be found for them. There's going to be so many. They're just going to be spilling out all the corners of Israel. And by the way, Gilead and Lebanon speaks of the full promise of the land by God to the Jewish people. The Lebanon today is part of the land God gave to Israel. And it will be returned to them. Where was I? There. And so, verse 11, and they will pass through the sea of distress, and he will strike the waves in the sea. What does that mean? It means they won't be distressing anymore. So that all the depths of the Nile will dry up, and the pride of Assyria will be brought down, and the scepter of Egypt will depart, and I will strengthen them in the Lord, and in his name they will walk, declares the Lord. And I'll just ask this, and we'll finish up tonight. Why, why, why does the Lord stick with Israel? I mean, for goodness sakes. Maybe a more personal question would be, why does the Lord stick with you? And I've asked that myself all day long. (laughs) Why, Lord, do you stick with me? Because as he said back in verse 8, I have redeemed them. I've redeemed them with my blood covenant. I've done everything I said I would do, and I have redeemed them. And the blood of his covenant, the, the blood of Jesus Christ saturates for redemption, does everything needed so that a holy God can continue to draw his people back to himself to whistle for us as we come a running back to Zion. And gang, that's where we're headed. 
I've said so many times, it's just been an interesting journey for me, I think, politically, in my own mind, watching our country and living out in this, in these last days in America. And I love this country. And I, I, I love some of the glorious history. And, and yet, you know, more and more, I just love Zion. I'm ready to go to Zion. And God's calling us there. And we will be there. Let's pray. Father, You are good. You are glorious. And You are King. And Lord, we are amazed at the peace and the comfort that You give us. Just by walking through Your Word here tonight, how remarkable Your Spirit is to speak truth to us. Thank You, Lord. And Father, while we recognize we have that peace that surpasses all comprehension by Your Spirit, Lord, we tonight, and you just agree with me in your heart if you agree to this, Lord, we tonight declare your dominion over us. The peace of your Spirit, but also, Lord Jesus, the peace of your dominion. You have rule. You have authority over this place and over our lives, Lord. And we bow the knee to you and declare Jesus Christ as King of kings and Lord of lords forever. In Jesus' name.